Hello everyone, this is Denise from Essential Wellness and we are day 15 of our uh, six week whole food plant-based no oil immersion program. And today we have a special guest of Kimberly Ashton, who is uh, apart from many other things, a food for life coach from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Kimberly is currently traveling around the world teaching and studying. Um, she has a history in uh, macrobiotics. Is that correct, Kimberly? Yep. And um, she's going to share part of her story today and then hopefully give us some tips and ideas on um, menus and menu planning. But also, um, what would be really nice is if she could tell us a little bit about um, her studies at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine under Dr. Neil Bernard, which you have all been learning about. So over to you, Kimberly. Excellent. Thank you very much. What a nice introduction. And I'm really excited to be here to share more about healthy eating, but specifically specifically whole food plant-based eating because I think that there's a lot of confusion out in the world um, about what to eat, um, what's really good for me and for me just starting or going back to rather simple basics is um, the most powerful and a lot of people over complicate things and there's a lot of wonderful recipes online and different dietary theories but if we just go back to the basics and eat simple food groups, which is in the PCRM, um, in Dr. Bernard's food um, plate. Just eat your, your beans and legumes, your vegetables, your grains, um, fruits and veggies. That's all the body really needs. Um, if you want to go into raw desserts and healthy, healthy, healthy sweets, that's fine, but it's, that's like an add-on. So for me, whole food plant-based, my, my journey um, began in 2009. So 10 years ago, uh, I was living in Shanghai. I've been in Shanghai uh, for 15 years. And uh, I came across Chinese medicine and food therapy, then macrobiotics, dabbled in a bit of raw food. Um, and then along the way, uh, about three, four years ago, I found um, Dr. Bernard's program, Food for Life, um, in Washington, which was a long way to go. But um, at that point in my life, I wanted to add. Um, a, a, or being associated with such a wonderful author and doctor and plant-based advocate, but also the program. Um, I used to have a health food store in Shanghai and we had a cooking studio. So food education, much like you, Denise, is, my, is at my heart and sharing information um, and empowering people really to take their health into their own hands. Nobody can, can help you as much as yourself and being able to apply practical um, tips and recipes and again just this basic going back to basics in the kitchen um, so yeah so the program I did with uh, Dr. Bernard and his team it's not just him he has a, he has a full team is uh, it was a three-day program um, there's no strict prerequisites you don't have to be a chef or a, a doctor to go but they do screen people um, and you have to fill in a form and you have a, a phone call interview. And basically it's like-minded people who really want to spread whole food plant-based. Mm -hmm. So the program covers a lot of different modules that they provided. So things like there's a module on diabetes, there's a module in each module is um, a pre-prepared class that um, as instructors, we can go and teach. So there's one for kids' health, one for diabetes, um, one for just general um, uh, whole foods, plant-based nutrition. Um, there's always a cooking demo element uh, and recipes. It's very, uh, again, simple, but effective to get people to go home and get their hands dirty and, and, and cook something delicious in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that's that program. Um, I don't know if you have any questions sure. on that before I keep going. Did you, have you noticed that there has been a rapid increase in people being interested in the whole food plant-based uh, way of eating? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, over 15 years in Shanghai, um, I personally have been on my plant-based journey for about 10, 
but I would say at 10 years ago, certainly in, in, in China, um, amongst Chinese and also foreigners, um, it wasn't really, whole food plant-based wasn't an acronym. It certainly wasn't well recognized. Plant, vegetarian, maybe people knew, and vegan, I don't think, especially in Chinese, people understood or um, knew how to cater for or understood the health benefits as well as environmental benefits. So I don't know, maybe Denise can, you can have your share too, but I would say about, from my observation, about six or seven years ago, healthy food and organics really gained momentum. And in the last maybe two or three years, vegan or whole food plant-based or even vegetarian has started to gain momentum. And by momentum, I mean, it's acceptable. Um, people are curious. Uh, we aren't sidelined like health freaks. Yes. Uh, and people want to try it. And that's mm -hmm. the biggest thing for me. Try some vegetarian food, have a vegan ice cream. Um, I think that's, there's many reasons for this momentum. First of all, people are getting sick and more and more people are getting sick in China at an alarming rate, that really it's, it's a wonderful, it's an unfortunate but wonderful time to reassess your lifestyle and think, oh, maybe I can eat more plants. And how is this gonna help me? And there's so much research and information and documentaries out there now, I really think that there's no argument for eating more plants. Um, and then the other thing is the availability. So when we first had our health food store, there really wasn't much for us to sell. <laughs> but now, just looking in the veggie groups and at the market in China, there's so much more available and so much more coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Whether all of the vegan food or plant-based food is healthy is, is a whole other topic. Not all of it is. You have mm -hmm. to read the labels. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, there's you know coconut yogurt and... Um, vegan cheese and vegan ice cream. And so I think consumer choice has also increased, which is, is really good. So yeah, a little bit of personal motivation is needed. And then market products, like consumers have to be able to access the alternative to meat um, because we're, we're inbuilt in our taste buds and our bodies and our cells with eating cheese and steak and ice cream, all these things I used to eat more than 10 years ago. Um, but I definitely don't miss them. That's a good news. And just changing the taste buds, I think that's really, really powerful. How long do you think it takes to actually change the taste buds, Kimberly? I think it requires, I'm not a big fan of the word detox, but I do like the, the full word detoxification. Um, and that can mean anything from like just stopping sugar well, that's not vegan or not, but it's certainly very unhealthy. I'd put that up there with all the, the saturated fat and, and steaks and, and, th and cheese. I think it's equally as, as toxic or unhealthy. So really cleansing the body from key foods that an individual may be addicted to or over consuming. So sugar is a big one. Um, milk is another one. People are, I, as a child, I drank far too much milk. I now know that that's not a good thing. Um, but we have this um, habit as well as uh, predisposition or taste buds that we just want to eat these foods. So it takes at least three to four weeks minimum, mm -hmm. I would say, to detox or cleanse or reset is another nice word, um, mm -hmm. the taste buds and, and the body and the mind as well. So sugar is a big one. Cheese is a huge one. Both of those are very highly addictive substances um, and milk and meat. So. So it takes time. Weeks. It takes it takes determination as well. So around about three weeks to sort of reset the taste buds in the body and to see some of the benefits. Okay, so yes. um, we're getting close to our immersion program. I think um, it's going to start uh, next Wednesday and it goes for for three weeks. So that's um, something that we've been working up towards. Um, but one of the questions I'd like to yep. ask you is uh, when we have families and friends. How, how do we approach, yes. them? how do we let them know? Because there is the individual journey where we're taking control of our health and we're empowering ourselves to look after our health by cleaning up our diet. But, mm -hmm. but there's family and friends. Would you like to give yeah, us some, some hints and sure. ideas on your, on your observations about how to navigate through that? Because that is 
that's quite a minefield for people. Absolutely. And you, you, you said it so well, it's an individual journey. So one of the things that we all struggle with, myself included, because we all have families and friends and kids and partners and colleagues, is um, not trying to push your food or your plate or your beliefs um, on other people. It's really hard. Um, so my personal experience with um, family and friends has been to uh, get really excited because I see the benefits. So this was a couple of years ago and I would want everyone to eat the way I do and I start talking about brown rice and green vegetables and green smoothies. But not everyone's ready to listen or hear it. So we have to remember that. So the best way actually is to, sh to show or lead by example. Are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Okay, sorry, the screen's just freezing. Um, so yeah, lead by example. So sort of put your head down, focus, learn the information, cook the recipes, get really good at making whole food plant-based dishes because if you want someone else to eat it, their level of acceptance is you know, not gonna be as, as, um, as low as, my, as mine or yours. For example, if I cook brown rice and some beans and, or make you know, vegan, I don't know, fried rice or tacos or whatever it is, or a salad, I may not need all the chili and salt and oil and all these other things. I've kind of made it really simple and tasty for me, but maybe not as tasty for other people whose taste buds are still uh, enjoying lots of salt, like over-salted, over-oiled food, whether it's vegan or not. So if you want to cook for family and friends, you really have to get in the kitchen and make time and prioritize uh, improving your skills because it's the only way that you're going to have buy-in or um, someone to eat with. Otherwise, they can eat their food at dinner and you eat yours. That's also fine in the beginning. Uh, don't criticize them. Don't feel bad about their pizza or their steak. Whatever they want to eat is what they want to eat. Um, but just take baby steps and it takes months or years. Um, at the same time, get them to look at some websites or links, but do it very subtly, very gently. Nobody likes to be force fed, literally, um, information or beliefs. So the best way actually is to get someone else to tell them. It's very, very powerful for, yes, for them to hear it from I've somebody else. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, and it's an ongoing, I don't want to call it a battle. I think that's a negative word, but it's an ongoing, uh, patient uh, journey, but everyone is on their own journey. So my partner personally, he's German, so he has like schnitzel and pizza and beer and all these wonderful things in his DNA. So it's taken four years for him to go off milk. Like he won't drink milk, he's on soy milk, but it took a long time to change those taste buds in coffee. Um, he's still, he's not vegan by any means, but he's taken steps. He recognizes fruits and vegetables are really important to eat more whole grains, to eat more vegetables, uh, leafy greens, salads. So it, it really takes time. And the longer someone has eaten lots of steak and lots of milk and ice cream, the longer it's going to take to change their, their habits and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, tips for um, making menus at all so thank you very much for sharing on on um handling families that's that's very very valuable it is one of the things that that we find like you mentioned that we have to become very good at uh, what we do in the kitchen because we're trying literally to win people over um so yes one of the, one of the things that we're we're doing this week is actually looking at menus and i've been recommending to the students that right. they plan their menus out so that yep. they have actually a lot more freedom um, and the, the time in the kitchen isn't so um, stressful, so to speak. So uh, what do you uh, yep. advise there? Sure. Um, I would say um, menu planning is, is based on, on pre-planning. So a couple of key things. enough stuff in the fridge uh, or groceries so the pre-planning of the cooking in, in 
in this menu planning phase is very important. So making sure you have your, your kitchen basics, your, your grains, your pastas, your, um, and when I say grains, I mean like quinoa or brown rice, black rice, millet, um, and then making sure you have um, those products in maybe a pasta form, so soba noodles or brown rice spaghetti or whole wheat macaroni, whatever it is. So have your grains, and your dry goods, your beans, your lentils on hand in the kitchen well stocked. Make sure you don't run out of those because then you don't have an excuse not to cook. Then um, have your staples of your proteins, your tofu, your tempeh. Sorry? That, yeah, sure. I mean, having all of those uh, dry goods is very important. If you've got them on stock, then, uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, I've actually taught my students is to um, also take some of the dried uh, products, you know, the dried beans, your legumes and that, and to soak them and cook them. And if you've got the freezer space, have um, yeah. sort of pre-cooked, like pre, yeah, pre-cooked um, legumes, so you can just pull them out. So if you're going to put on a pot of um, of uh, kidney beans, you may as well cook enough for four servings, and then use one and put three away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, starting to stock your your kitchen, and then buying fruits and vegetables, so you always have like a key couple of staples, like I always have onions, carrots, maybe green beans, garlic, um, as like a base and then just pick up different things. So get into this habit of buying vegetables um, for the week that you know that, you know, maybe a couple of nights you might go out, but for the most part you'll be home, so you always have something to cook. So once you have that um, as a base, you can also then add to it. And then for me, that's when the menu planning would come out. Okay, I'm going to cook brown rice, fried rice. So I'm going to cook kidney beans with a stew and make, uh, I don't know, make tacos or have a lentil, a pot of lentils boiled. And then what you can also do with beans as a base or grains is have the, the beans cooked or the lentils cooked and then take out what you need and then make a, a lentil soup or a red lentil bolognese or a kidney bean bean salad. So if you have those, those um, grains and beans cooked, you can add flavors and herbs and vegetables to that. Um, I also suggest for people uh, who like Excel spreadsheets or you can write them by hand, is to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, a chart. And if it helps, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and just start to think ahead. You don't have to cook three meals a day, seven days a week. If you're working or studying or um, busy with kids, whatever your lifestyle is, but just get into the habit of starting to think about what am I going to eat today or tomorrow or later this week. And if you're out for dinner three times a week or you work at a, and you have a cafeteria, you can make the intention to eat, okay, vegetables and rice for three, three lunches or whatever it is. Ideally, you're bringing your own food and you're cooking more, but realistically, it's, it's, it's okay to just in that menu planning to for the week um, to expect or to plan for eating out, but know what you, what you are going to eat when you're even eating out. Sure. Eating out's a big hurdle. That's the third question I'd like to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, we've, we've looked at eating. It's a personal journey and eating the healthy food that we need. And then we looked at menus, yeah. but then this, the next part, the most important part, I think that tends to trip up a lot of, um, new healthy eaters is actually eating out with friends and traveling around yep. and eating outside the house. What tips, what tips do you have? Yep. Um, I have lots actually. Um, I'm just thinking if I would be, if you want, I can share some information that you can send to your um, students later, but um, off the top of my head, um, a key, a key few, point so one would be dressings or sauces so always ask for them on the side the restaurant the waiter the chef can do this it's not hard so then you can control how much salad dressing you putting on most of them have sugar and oil unfortunately um or just ask for i know you guys are doing oil free but later on um ask for everything on the side the oil um especially if it's a thick dressing then you can control the quantity of what you put on um, when you're eating out, I always like to look up the restaurant of where I'm going 
or where my friends have suggested and seeing if you can see the menu or call ahead. If you are in a strict detox phase or um, a transition phase and you really don't want to eat uh, things there, then you can pick side dishes. If it's a Western restaurant, side dishes are always going to be good. There's always going to be a vegetable or a salad that you can have. Uh, Chinese food, uh, apart from the oil, uh, always ask for the MSG out of it. That's very easy to do. They will do it for you. Tell them you're allergic to it. And um, you can always order, uh, worst case scenario, rice and vegetables. And then the third tip would be, and I often do this, is to eat ahead. So I will have um, a snack or half a dinner before I go. And just be, to be social while you're there, you can pick at the veggies or order those, those um, I don't know, some pumpkin or potato or a side salad or side green beans or whatever it is, so that you're still being social because you don't want to lose all your friends. Um, and then people will get curious. I find that people think that going whole food plant-based is boring or tasteless, but honestly, people just don't know much about it. Your family, your friends, they don't know as much as you know, and we're all trying to learn. So the more that you can... Um, pass on the information in a non-threatening way like oh i'm i, I don't want to eat steak or i'm on this on this um plant-based three week or six week program or whatever it is or I've, if you've changed completely and you say i don't eat meat anymore um i don't eat sugar anymore if you say it in a nice way they won't be angry they'll actually be curious and part of them this much or this much they're probably jealous because they wish they could do the same thing so just be an inspiration to them um, by, by, by living what you're, you're studying or living what you want to adopt and just be smart. So pre-ordering, -look, like looking at the menu, having a snack or eating something before you go so you don't get stuck in a steak restaurant with nothing to eat and you're hungry. That's not good. Um, so yeah, a little bit of, of planning and common sense. Um, I have been known to bring my own brown rice to hot pot um, as well. So I would go and have a veggie broth and have my tofu and all the, all the veggies, which is wonderful in, in China. Uh, but I bring my own brown rice because this restaurant didn't have rice at all. So I bring it and it's, 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 it's cooked and it's warm. I bring it with me in a little container and I enjoy dinner with everybody. I don't eat the meat and I have, I'm full because I brought my brown rice. And again, people are just more curious than anything else. Okay, so um, Kimberly, thank you so much for that. Uh, we've just been joined by Alan. Um, so the first question that um, we've been recording this um, uh, talk. So the first question that we asked uh, Kimberly was, um, uh, let me see, I've, I've kind of forgot, what was it? Um, oh, it was about um, PCRM in Washington. Yep, yep, Kimberly shared her, her her experiences at the PCRM. And then the second was uh, talking about um, eating out with friends, uh, like it at home mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. dealing with friends and family as you're eating. And then the third, third question was about um, just going out and eating with others. So we've covered mm -hmm. pretty much all of the questions that um, we wanted to cover. But Kimberly, just one extra question is, would you like to talk very briefly about your love affair with brown rice? Because I've heard it mentioned sure. many times. <laughs> no one's ever said it in that way, but I like it. Um, absolutely. So my, one of my favorite foods, it's not only my favorite food, but one definitely is brown rice. Um, I am a firm believer in whole grains, um, no matter what the no carb people say or um, ketogenic diet people say or whatever, paleo, whatever any of those say. Uh, I do firmly believe because I've experienced it and I feel it, uh, I feel how good I feel and look when I eat brown rice and when I switched 10 years ago from white rice to brown rice. Um, so brown rice for me is so important. Um, and I'm so passionate about it, mainly because of my um, study and experience in macrobiotics, which is the, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle um, of balance, yin and yang. It has some roots in Chinese medicine, um, but essentially for the most part, and this can, it can be applied to every culture in the world, in, in Italy or in Alaska or in uh, Australia, it doesn't matter. It's not 
technically vegan. It actually doesn't have any labels attached to it. It's just about eating in balance and understanding through food energetics what foods are neutral and what foods are extreme. So mm-hmm. for, for us, brown rice is right in the middle. It's, it's grown technically in the middle of, 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 it's not a root vegetable and it's not a leafy green. It's right in the middle, um, very close to land and soil. Um, it's got a wonderful uh, range. Sorry? I think it's considered a seed. Mm, it can be, yeah. If, if, if rice and all, yeah, grains, yeah, you can put them in there. So at seeds is another interesting topic too. <laughs> Everyone eats nuts, but they don't have enough seeds. So pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, I throw them in there too. They're, they're very, very good foods for everybody. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a fan of nuts, seeds, grains, um, as we call them in, in, in the modern day, because they are tiny, but they're so full. They're nutrient dense foods. Uh, mm-hmm. Same as beans, like azuki beans or mung beans or chickpeas, lentils. This, they're small, but they pack a powerful punch and they are easy to digest. They provide a lot of vitamins and nutrients and minerals, um, which a lot of people are missing in the modern day um, diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I don't eat brown rice, this doesn't happen, but say if it did happen for longer than a week or two, um, I actually start to, to miss the wholesomeness of it because it usually means I'm eating too much white rice if I'm traveling or not enough veggies. Um, because if I'm eating out a lot, which I have been in the last uh, three weeks um, on the road, I have to make extra effort to find hotels or chefs or restaurants that will supply or cook or have on their menu foods that I want to eat, including brown rice uh, or whole grains, let's just say. It doesn't have to be just brown rice. But um, my body misses it. If I just, and I don't eat white bread, but if I just ate white bread and white rice, um, and tofu and vegetables, which is a lot of the vegetarian or vegan food in China, um, it's actually not, it's not healthy. So I would put brown rice and whole grains as one of my top uh, suggested foods. And I, I really wish people weren't so afraid of carbohydrates because ca- complex carbohydrates, the good ones, um, is what we need. Mm -hmm. Um, Just a question, with the brown rice, do you have any particular brands that you favour? Because um, I've noticed at Metro, I've been going up and buying uh, a Thai brown rice. It's a long grain brown rice. I actually like that more than just the regular brown rice. It's it's somewhat easy to eat and a little bit more versatile. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. So there are lots of different um, species of rice grains and seeds. Um, these days, in general, we don't have access to as many. Um, for example, in India, they have, I, heard, I thought it was about 50, but I heard there was over 100 types of millet. There are really? hundreds of types of rice as well. The, yeah, and the, the, the sad thing about our modern day food culture is that our food choices of any food, even vegetables or anything, is, is shrinking because it's not popular. People don't grow it. Um, people don't know what to do with it uh, or they don't like the color of it. You know, everyone wants white rice, but brown rice or black millet or yellow, whatever, or purple potatoes. For me, the more color and depth uh, and texture, the better. So, but brown rice, to answer your question really simply, if you have a short grain or a long grain rice, Mm-hmm. If we just talk about rice, so basmati rice is a long grain, it's skinny um, and, a, and a round normal rice and there's everything in between. Um, they're all great depending what flavor and texture you like. So for the most part, I would say just eat any brown rice you like. Definitely pre-soak it, cook it uh, in a pressure cooker, rice cooker or a pot. But if you want to go one level deeper, this is probably a little bit off topic, but on, just on the side of the topic is um, it, again in macrobiotics, one of the reasons I like it is we, we, we go a little bit into where things are grown and seasonally. So basmati rice is grown more on the, the south of India. It's grown in Thailand in warm tropical places. So definitely eat it. It's no problem. Uh, if you live in Shanghai or Suzhou or I don't know where all the students live, but I presume in Suzhou. Um, then, oh, sorry, Ningbo. You're in Ningbo, right? Ningbo. Ningbo. Yeah, Ningbo. <laughs> yeah, Ningbo. So close enough to Shanghai, Shanghai and surrounds. Um, eating basmati rice 
in summer is perfect. It's warm, it's hot, that it's suitable to eat that kind of grain. And in winter, I personally would eat more of a short grain brown rice and things like buckwheat, if we're talking about other grains. Um, that's, it's just a yin and a yang thing. I don't really want to confuse people. But for the most part, any brown rice, red rice, black rice is, is great. And mm. whatever suits your, whatever you want to do with it, rice salads, um, fried rice, just a bowl of rice, um, all the grains will work. But um, yeah, that's just a little added insight to, if you want to start thinking about seasonality then I, and where things are grown. Um, in, in, historically, the short grain rices are grown up further north of Asia. So North Japan, Northern China, Korea, um, they don't, you, you don't traditionally find basmati style long grain rice there. This is not the right climate for it. Sure. So that makes sense. So, uh, we try and encourage the students to eat seasonally and also eat locally where possible. Um, and um, that definitely yeah. has a lot of benefits. Yeah. I, as you know, I teach, um, uh, you know, uh, fermenting and I'm a big pr promoter mm. of uh, sauerkraut. And I believe very strongly in eating vegetables um, and using vegetables that yes. are grown around you because of the bacteria. Yeah. It's a local bacteria and it helps you to adjust to the environment. So uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think we have probably covered everything that we needed to cover. I'm just going to uh, unmute our, our guest, Alan, and just see if Alan's got any questions he'd like to ask. I'm just trying to see if sure. I can mute. Okay. Um, I think Alan, actually, you're on. Okay, thank you. Nice to meet Hi, you. Alan. Really? Hello. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I've known the story about short um, chain and long chain carbohydrates for many, many years. Um, but I've not known mm -hmm. what to do about them in regard to my current condition. So without getting into, uh, you know, comparing scars and, and, and um, aches and pains and things, uh, the thing is, um, what would you suggest for resource information for uh, issues regarding cardiac? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I can send the uh, eating out notes that I, I offered uh, to Denise and she can circulate to, to everybody. And in terms of specifically um, for cardiac health, I would say my general answer, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex topic, but high fiber, low saturated fat. That's the simplest uh, answer. Uh, okay. On the high fiber note though, um, so whole grains, brown rice is, is wonderful. Anything that has um, a, a bran or many layers of fiber. Uh, root vegetables are fantastic as are cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower. Um, I'm not sure which vegetables you like, but I, there's, there's really high fiber vegetables. If you live in China, there's some incredible ones like okra. Not everyone likes it, but it's a, it's okra a really is very good high for fiber one. Well. Um, absolutely. Yes. Yes. So the more variety of high fiber foods, the better. Dried? Yeah. I found a source for freeze dried okra. Not fried okra, but freeze dried. Every other way, oh, yes. okra is off my menu. I, know. I discovered no this problem. And, That's uh, fine. It was great with the creamy. Um, uh, unfortunately, I discovered uh, I have to lay off the nuts, but uh, looking for creamy sauces to, for dips and things. So I've got me a. Okay. Yeah, I got me a scoop. Now I need a new dip. So. But those are easy to Excellent. Find. Okay. I'm sure Denise has some nice yeah. cashew cheeses and avocado dips and sauces that, uh, uh, that she can share. But in general, reducing the, the saturated fat. So as you just mentioned, the, the, the cheeses and the dips, like you can make incredible creamy ones um, from, if you don't want to go with too many nuts, then seeds as well, like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seed, the same process, soak them, blend them up. Um, they can be somewhat creamy. Avocado even uh, is a nice one as well. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, I don't know how much time we have. I could talk for, for hours, but high fiber, so 
all the whole grains um, and vegetables, but really focusing on the, the, the high fiber nutrient dense ones. So as wonderful as lettuce is in a salad, for me, if I was to eat a salad, uh, I would have to have arugula and some carrots and some or even spinach, and um, I love artichokes and beans in the salad. So trying to bulk up the, the, the salad, um, I don't know if you, salad is your thing, I'm just using as an example, but, um, and beans are wonderful as well in all shapes and forms, um, in stews and soups and salads. I, I don't know Denise's position on canned food. I'm not a huge advocate of canned food, but for the purposes of transition, I think that canned beans, as long as you warm them up and, and cook them, they're a wonderful resource um, to add fiber and it's a really easy way to add fiber. Yep, that's for sure. Cans when um, nothing else is available. But it's, it's yeah, better sure. And so it's better yeah. to eat canned leg legumes than to eat no legumes at all. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, I, but yeah. For, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, no problem. We just about ready to wrap up here. So, okay. Kimberly. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, it was a fascinating, um, uh, fascinating interview. And we've been recording it. So we've got this. Um, My pleasure. For the students. So, um, yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Alan, for um, being able to join us. So, Bruce, this is. Uh, <laughs> very good. It, it, for the most part, I've been a veggie a long time. So, you're reinforcing many of the things. I have learned, um, but I've been, um, well, I've been here eight years and I was isolated okay. prior to that for a couple of years. So I was um, uh, interested in making sure that my knowledge base uh, it was up to date and I'm mm -hmm. discovering that much of what I have learned is still viable. However, there have been some new things that Denise and her uh, group over there that I've that managed to meet and join has um, uh, shown me a number of new things that are very interesting and, and um, noteworthy for me to look deeper into. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be meeting you and learning a little bit more. So thanks. That's great. And there is, as Denise said, this is recorded and we talked a lot before you joined. So please go back. Okay. I can uh, have a have a listen when you have time. Thank you. All right. So right. thank you everybody once again. Thank you, Kimberly, for being here. Thank you, Alan, for joining. And we'll just sign out here. And so thanks very much and peace out from Denise. <laughs> <laughs> peace out from Denise. Uh, I don't hear a oh, microphone. Thank you.